Hello. Today I'm going to talk about the joy of learning, the gift of learning, and what is learning but to acquire skills or abilities that you didn't have before. So I read this book, Rediscover the Joy of Learning. I got this book because I watched the presenter, Don Blackerby, on a EFT program, that's Emotional Freedom Technique, talk about the fact that schools do not teach students to learn. They don't teach the best techniques and strategies to learn. So because of that, students can have very poor abilities to learn well, and they get further and further behind. Everything in school is built on a foundation, so you have to learn the skills that are taught in first grade to do well in second grade. And then you have to learn the second grade skills to do well in third grade. So once a student gets far behind and he's completely out of the loop and doesn't understand things anymore, he doesn't enjoy his experience in school, and who would? So how does the school teach a child to learn? Well, they basically rely on support system of home, parents and friends. So if your child is at school, the teacher sits in front of a class of 30 and he can't give one-on-one -on -one attention to anybody. So he has to present his lesson on the board and then rely on the student taking it home and doing th maybe 30 examples of what he's trying to teach so it becomes ingrained in the child and the child learns by doing the examples. You, everybody's been in that position where if you don't understand how to do the example, somebody has to explain to you what it is. And that's where the parents come in. If the parents can't explain what's going on in the example or let's say they're too busy to help the child with his homework, the child can't learn. So. Blackerby made a point that no matter how far behind a student was, he could help them get back up to their grade level within a relatively short period of time by teaching them good learning strategies. Once the learning strategies were acquired, then the student could continue on learning at their own rate. Of course, having a tutor probably would help in most regards because you need somebody to explain things that you don't understand. What happens in class? The teacher puts the uh, problem on the board or asks you to read the book or whatever, and if you can't, then you can't. He's not gonna hold up class and give you one-on-one -on -one instruction while everybody else um, sits there twiddling their thumbs. So, um, you know, the point is, there's certain techniques and strategies that are more effective at learning than others. And so what are those techniques and strategies? Well, for one, um, I think that Dan Millman said it very well in his book, uh, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which in his second book where his character goes to Hawaii, he made the statement that if I hear it, it goes in one ear and out the other. If I see it, I can remember it. And if I actually do it, hands-on, then I'll have the best ability to remember it of all. Similarly, doctors have a saying, see one, do one, teach one. So the, the doctor will watch another doctor perform a procedure, so he's seen it. Then he will do it with the aid of a senior so that he gets it right and has the experience of doing it. And then, if he really wants to be a master of that procedure, he teaches it. Because in teaching things, a lot of issues come up that you don't consider when you're just learning. I know I've taught a few things, and it's very difficult, and you have to have a much greater command of what you're doing than when you just go along with somebody else showing it. So visually, it's much more powerful than auditorily. You look at the words, you are gonna have a better memory of it. So when you're studying for a test, you wanna actually see what it is that you're trying to work on. You have to see the, the formula, you have to see the numbers, 
And if you can touch them, that's even better, at least when you're little. The thing I like to do for beginning mathematics for children is to use a t the tactile and visual process of using pennies as numbers. So if I'm teaching uh, math to my eight-year-old grandson, then I'm going to show him, I'm going to spread a lot of coins out on the table and ask him to show me how he would represent the number 42 with pennies. And then I'm going to impress upon him that the ones column is for one pennies and the four column is not for four pennies, but the four in the tens column represents four groups of ten pennies. And when he puts ten pennies out in a row, and that's one group, and another ten pennies, and another ten pennies, and another ten pennies, he visually gets to see what forty pennies look like. He physically got to put them out there, so he has a physical experience of that. And he's going to conceptually understand that the four in the tens column means four groups of ten. Okay, so the tactile way of learning math is to have the visual and the hands-on. So here's the number four and two, and when we put it in this way, it's 42. The first number indicates the ones column. The second number to the left of it indicates the tens column. And to show tens, we can either put down dimes, which are ten pennies, or we can put out the pennies. And I think that it's a good idea to put out the pennies. And then you can just physically see very easily what four groups of ten pennies looks like. So it's impressive. There's four groups of ten pennies. There's two single pennies. That's 42. So if you took the pennies away, it'd be four dimes and two pennies. That's 42. And when you physically lay them out like that, you start to get an idea exactly what this second column means, how it's different from the first column. A multiplication, three times four, and do it with pennies. 3 times 4 would be 3 groups of 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have 1 group of 4, 2 groups of 4, 3 groups of 4. And if we add them all together, it equals 12. And, if, and because we're going to put it in 10s and 1s, let's take this group of 2 four, six, eight, ten, and that becomes one ten and two ones. So this twelve pennies didn't change except in the way we noted it, and we changed it into one group of ten. It always has to be converted into a, a group of ten and then the, the ones that are left over. So three times four, three groups of four is like adding 4 plus 4 plus 4, which equals 12, and it's represented as one group of 10 and two ones. It also is interesting that you can use the uh, coins as fractions because a quarter is basically a fraction. It's one quarter of which four quarters make one. And what is it a quarter of? Well, it's a quarter of a dollar, which is a hundred pennies. So a quarter is 25 pennies, and it's one-fourth of a hundred pennies, or a dollar. But if you start looking at multiplication as basically addition, then you say it's easy to represent that physically and visually to your child. Eventually, you're going to do flashcards where memorization is going to make the number instantaneously in your mind so that you don't have to physically count on your fingers or multiply on a piece of paper. In reading, you need to learn basic reading skills, and the basic reading skills are going to be initially learning to phonetically sound out the letters. So if you have the plastic numbers and letters and you hold the you, letters up and you ask your child, you know, find me an A. 
and a B and a D and a G and eventually they understand by physically touching the letters and holding them and when they get to the point where they understand all their letters then you move on to what are the sounds those letters make and some letters will have only one sound associated with them others will have mul multiple sounds associated with them but if the person if the child starts off trying to sound out the words, eventually they'll get familiar when they see the word and the sounds that it makes to make that word, eventually they'll know that word. This is using letters and I think that um, getting these plastic letters which you can get from Amazon, this set here was um, $12 I think, gives you visual and tactile. I mean you're actually touching them. So. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Then you ask your child to pick out the letter A, let's say, and he picks out the A, and ask him what sound does the A make? The A makes a sound of A, the p, 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 play sound, P, L, a, Y, and then when you sound out the letters, the P sound is a P, P, P sound. The L sound is a L, L sound. The A sound is an A sound. It can be an A sound, like an apple, or animal, A, animal. It can also be an A sound is in play. It can also be the a uh, sound, uh, applause, uh, about. So you get them to sound out each of the letters as they pick them up and then they realize that the O sounds like O. Oh. And then when they start sounding out words, they can decide what the word means by sounding it out phonetically. Now, of course, English is a very hard language to sound out phonetically because so many things make different sounds than what they look like. But it's a good place to start. And once the child can learn to see the letters, pick the letters, know what the letters are, know what the sounds that the letters make, and then they can start basic reading. You notice initially that a children's books are always picture books. I mean, you know, the large red apple. Okay, so we have a large red apple and we show what the apple is and when the parent looks over at the other page at the picture of the apple, they point at the apple and they go, apple. That's how the child learns. They see what the fruit is and they recognize the fruit. They've seen it in real life and then they understand that that word for that thing is apple. So that's how they start to learn to identify things. You can start with body parts, you know. Um, parents are always pointing to their eyes and say, I, right? But then when you start looking at the way it's spelled, it's E-Y-E. -E. And then if you put those letters together and you say, this is the I, and you point to your I, this is I. That's how it's spelled. I. It's a visual tactile experience and it is a more powerful way of retaining that knowledge than um, just hearing it. I mean, so you get a dictionary, right? If you want to learn vocabulary words. In order to teach, you're going to want to have the vision of having a shovel when associated with the word dig to break or turn up soil with a spade or other instrument. Well, they mean a shovel. To make a hole excavation, etc., etc., by removing earth. He dug a well in the garden. Three, to get something out by turning up the ground, to dig potatoes, to dig worms. So the association you're going to have is the picture is going to be a shovel the word is going to be dig and when you say the word dig you want to associate the picture of the shovel so that when you're reading and the 
in the story it says you know Johnny dug the um, potatoes out of the ground you understand what that means if you associate the picture with the definition and the word dig and you say the word dig six times the other thing Blackerby says that's interesting is he says once you spell it out loud spell it backwards and if you can spell a word backwards it is almost a requirement that you actually picture the word in your mind so you're I'm seeing the word dig in my mind which allows me to go backwards of G-I-D because you know especially with larger words it's difficult to spell a word backwards so the word bat B-A-T the B makes a B sound the A makes an A sound and the T makes a T sound and we sound it out as bat and after they see it a bunch of times and sound it out a bunch of times it'll just come naturally that that word is bat from there the only thing that they're going to do to increase their reading ability is acquire a vocabulary so there are standard words that are required to be known for kindergarten first grade second grade they're called sight words if you look them up you can get a long list of sight words and if you practice with using those sight words so that they know the meaning and the definition of those sight words and the quickest way to learn that once again is visually you use the sight word and you associate the written definition of that sight word and if there's a picture that you can associate with it like cat then you use the picture on top of it you describe what it is to the child and make him talk about it and and explore it so that when he's done he has a thorough understanding of the meaning of the word now technically in my mind a word should only mean one thing there shouldn't be more than one meaning for a word so the word should be changed if they expect to have a different meaning from the same word but the English language is a very strange language and it is what it is once you get on past the ability to read simply and increase your vocabulary enough to enjoy reading then it gets into writing my father when I was young told me something that I always remember that I thought was very um, interesting and that is that those people that are good writers are good readers and the reason for that is you know books are not published in a form where the English is not correctly done the grammar is correctly done the vocabulary words are correctly done and if the writer the writer has to be good at English in order to get a book published and if he makes a few mistakes proofreaders will look read through the book and find and circle the mistakes and have them changed so somebody who reads a lot is going to see how a sentence is structured how words are used in that sentence to evoke a meaning and you're going to copy those styles because you're trying to write and one of the easiest thing to do is to copy some other writer the style that he uses you're not going to make things so simple that it's going to be Jack went to the store <laughs> you know what I mean a good writer is going to evoke your imagination and say you know Jack the butcher's son you know some kind of descriptor the description that your imagination is going to take and run with is going to be put in so that it makes the sentence and the writing more interesting if you read a lot you are going to be a better writer now today in this day and age young people have far too much interaction with electronic devices everybody watches movies everybody uh, goes on YouTube myself included and they don't have a history of reading and they miss out when they don't read and never read and one of the th biggest things you miss out on is reading inspires your imagination to kick in you can't read and not 
invoke your imagination because it would be dull and boring otherwise. I mean, you have to invoke your imagination, otherwise the book doesn't really do anything for you. So when you say the big scary monster appeared in the doorway, in a movie they show you what that big scary monster looks like. And so there's no imagination required. You see it. But in a book, you have to imagine what you think a monster looks like and what big means. How big is the monster? Is it as big as the Death Star that's as half as big as your planet? Or is it, you know, as big as a um, mountain lion or a praying mantis? <laughs> It's all relative and it's your imagination. So how are you going to exercise your mind and develop your imagination if you don't read? And at the same time, if you don't write. If you try writing a book, you'll soon see, try to teach it, if you try to do it, it's going to have a completely different experience on you. You're going to have to be much more a master of uh, creative storytelling in order to write. So I hope that uh, parents don't lose hope that their child has fallen behind in school and that it's impossible to correct their position of feeling less than the other students and that there are hopeful ways of correcting the learning situation so that you can become a better student. Once you become a better student, you can go on to anything. And one of those ways of learning to be a better student is to remember to visualize and get hands-on with what you're doing. And then, what's the motivation for doing that? I mean, most people go, you know, I don't care what I learn in school, it doesn't make a difference in my life. Well, maybe at 12 years old or 16 years old, you don't see that it would make a difference in your life. But that's the job of the parents to convince the child and show the child that it does make a difference in their life. Whatever you want to be when you grow up, doesn't matter what you want to be, you are going to need to know how to communicate with other people. Because unless you're going to work for yourself and are completely self-contained and don't ever interact with anybody else in your work, you are going to have to talk to them. You are going to have to write things down that, are, that is easy to understand. I mean, if you write a contract, <clears throat> the contract better spell out everything that's valuable to you and to the other party. Because you can't write a contract that's vague and enforce that contract. If you go to work for some place, they're going to want you to write occasionally. They're going to want you to read messages and notices. They're going to want you to talk to a customer, maybe. So these are skills that are valuable so that you can enjoy your life. Doesn't matter what you want to do, you're going to need to have those skills. And the better those skills are, the better you're going to enjoy your position as a doing, a, doing work or doing what you want to do. It's not by accident that rich people send their children to private schools and that those private schools teach them to enter into debates more. The reason than you want to enter into debates is because leaders stand in front of other people and know how to speak well and communicate their ideas. Debate People that are on debate teams do that well. So if you want to be a leader of men, and that's what rich people want their children to be, <clears throat> enter into the debate team and learn how to be a good debater. It's going to help you in having a position of power and leadership. You, are, you can't get ruffled. You can't have your feelings hurt. You have to be cool, calm, collect, and express yourself in a way that shows others you are intelligent, you are considerate, whatever it is that other people are going to warm to, you want to be that. So these are just things to consider motivationally how to get your child to be more interested in learning 
If you don't understand geometry, you're not going to be able to build a house. I've built houses, and if your structure isn't square and plumb, and you don't understand geometry, that house is going to be an extremely difficult house for you to build. It's going to take you an excessive amount of time, and crooked houses aren't fun to live in. Everything is custom. Every time you put a piece of plywood up and it's not square to the wall, that means you have to custom cut things to make them work. Does that really benefit you or the person you're building the house for? Or, you know, what happens if you, when you start building a house that isn't square and plumb, the foundation isn't level, everything gets affected. Everything. So, these are, you know, geometry is not a hard skill to learn and you wonder what it what it can do thing with trigonometry it's like who wants to study sines and cosines and all that but if you understand simple to use techniques you can figure out how tall a flagpole is without climbing the flagpole and putting a tape measure down it from the ground very simply is that useful i mean maybe it is to you and maybe it's not but it does have a use and all you have to do is explain why it's useful and the student may find it interesting. Obstacles. One of the biggest obstacles that one has to learning is they get a preformed belief. After you do badly for a number of years, either your friends make fun of you or the teacher makes fun of you, and according to them, you are either stupid or lazy. And if you believe, if you believe that you are stupid and lazy and that you can't learn, then it's going to be a real problem to learn, isn't it? Because you are already sabotaging your own success. So you can't believe that. You have to stop believing. The belief system to have that replaces that belief system is it's not your fault that you didn't learn. It's the fault of your teacher. He didn't show you how to view the thing in such a way that you can remember it so that you have a mastery of it. And most, most skills that are pretty simple can be demonstrated and, and explained in such a way that you can learn them. If you want to learn math problems and you're, let's say you have a problem with algebra, it's a little too complicated for you. Well, basically you should have a good foundational um, understanding of math and the, the things that would help somebody in math at an algebra level would be that you have your multiplication tables down to a science where you can just know instantly what anything from 1 to 10 times 1 to 10 is. Anything from 10 times 10 down to 1 times 1, you can just recite it immediately. So if you have those basic building blocks, then of course the higher level stuff is going to be easy. One thing they have now that they didn't have when I was a kid was you can go on YouTube and somebody will show you and tutor you in how to do things. Math is one of those things. You can find dozens and dozens of people that are teaching how to do algebra. Is it the kind of algebra that you're learning in your class at the moment? Maybe it's going to be difficult to find the exact same thing. There are things that you can learn on YouTube that qualify as like having a tutor that are free to you and if your parents don't know how to do it look it up online and see if you can't get the free help there. I have seen tutorials on YouTube that are done very well and explain things very clearly. Now it you still may not be able to understand it and you may need to get a tutor. The next issue I'm going to talk about would be like Blackerby says, if you are having anxiety about taking tests, you're not going to do as well on the test because you're nervous about it. There should be a way for you to calm down your anxiety over taking the test. And oftentimes anxiety is just that, it's nervous energy. What I use for conquering anxiety is uh, EFT and breathing. If you just sit and concentrate on your breath for a while and realize it's okay to calm down and not be nervous. It's not a life or death situation. And if you can calm down, 
you will be able to think more clearly and the answers will bubble up in your mind more easily. Another thing that happens often is that students will study very hard the night before a test and the next morning they'll come in sleepy, groggy, and you can't take a test under those conditions and do well. Your studying should be pretty much complete before the test day. And studying all night the night before or studying very hard the night before oftentimes doesn't help. And it certainly won't help as much as if you study in a way that is going to give you better uh, better ability to remember. So if you study in such a way that you're visually imagining the things, you're visually seeing the things, you're attaching a visual thing to the, to the thing you're studying, you will remember it better and the test will be much easier for you.